Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, world renowned drummer percussionist, Wilfredo Reyes Jr. And now, Rich Redman. How is everybody doing out there? I usually say, what's up, rock and rollers? But I realize there's a lot of people that like a lot of different kinds of music that are listening to the show. So I don't know if that's accurate, but hello to everyone out in podcasting land. This is the Rich Redmond Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. Jim, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com, my co-host. How you doing, buddy? Doing very well, you. You look comfy, man. You look warm. Very comfy. You got some eggnog? <laughs> um... That's my happy face cup. It's to you know, remind everybody to have a well, good uh, attitude. Jim, it's good to see you. After I see my parents for the holidays, we're going to get together, man. We're going to break yeah. bread. It's going to happen. New Year's or something? Or I don't know. Yeah, like right before New Year's, we will do something. Yeah. But I just wanted to say thanks. Jim, I, this is incredible. This was a dream. You and I started this about a year and a half ago. When this episode comes out, we'll probably have about 110 episodes in the can. And we're talking to musicians, actors, producers, thought leaders, just having a fun, free-flowing conversation. And today is no different. This is a, a He's become a fast friend. He always has the most colorful shirts. He is a Cuban-American drummer and percussionist. He's been tired call on the scene for decades. Look at some of the people that he's played with. This is just like the tip of the iceberg. Tanya, Maria, David Lindley, Jake, Jackson Brown, Santana, Boscax, Gloria Stefan, Traffic, Robbie Robertson, Steve Winwood, and recently, for I think the last six years or so, he'll set me straight, the drummer in the band Chicago, my friend, Wilfredo Reyes Jr. Hi. What's up? I did, I, I did my best to roll my R's, man. <laughs> Reyes. <laughs> Reyes. Yeah, I'm still teaching my, my wife that, you know, it gets the girls excited. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble. No, but you know, I, I think a lot of your, your close friends, they call you Wally, right? I Wally, mean, yeah, it's really yeah. easy. And that's why I started Wally World because it was Wally, 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 Wally. I love that. I love that. And and you you come from just such a musical family. Your dad, uh, your dad, your brother. You have another brother that's an actor. Take us through the family legacy there. Oh man! So so you know my my mother and father's side in Cuba were all musicians from way back. Yeah. And so my my grandfather, paternal grandfather, trumpet player, and then my dad became a drummer, percussionist, and you know he's been. And the orchestras in Cuba and Puerto Rico playing for American artists and Latin artists and then Las Vegas. And then when I arrived in Las Vegas, I started playing percussion and became a, I started working as a percussionist all over the place while in high school and then started studying drum set. And then my we're, other brother, we're Danny, in, which plays we're in a Vegas. band, uh, the girls married and didn't become musicians, but they're still very talented. Mm -hmm. And then I have another uh, 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 brother that actually started dancing and playing all kinds of instruments, but became an actor. And then my, now my daughter, Liliana de los Reyes, which sings and plays percussion with George Benson. Beautiful. And my other two sons also play too. You know, they're, they're like rocking out, you know. I remember breaking bread with your dad at like a percussive art society thing, maybe 10 years ago. And he was so sweet. And I sat next to him and he, we, were, we were sharing a cheesecake and he was telling us all these old war stories. He was bragging on his sons. It was a really very cool thing. And then I looked him up last night. I was in a, I was in a YouTube rabbit hole of the Reyes family. And your dad was in some instructional performance thing, playing percussion with Weckl in 93. It was really yeah. cool. Yes. And, and then your website is great. Tons of videos of your performances with everyone from Lindsey Buckingham to Steve Winwood. I think Steve Winwood lives here in Nashville. Yeah, he has a house in Nashville and one in England because his wife is from Nashville. Wow. Gina. Yeah, so, uh, so the kids, uh, it's really hilarious. I mean, I hope they're not watching because, you know, like, I mean, the kids are amazing because they do the English accent and the Nashville accent. 
perfect. <laughs> so when they talk to mom, they actually get into the Nashville accent. And when they talk to dad, they change back into British accent. That's incredible. <laughs> so now Jim was Jim's a Vegas guy. He was wondering where you were in Vegas. Oh, yeah. I, I arrived in Vegas in 1970. I went to K.O. Knudsen Junior High and Valley High School. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then I went two years to college. But by the time I started college, I was already working professionally. You know, a lot of people say, well, how did you, man, I'll tell you the truth. I was the oldest of five. I had to work because dad had no money for college or anything. So as soon as I realized if I want to wear hip clothes, I'm going to have to make my own money. I started <laughs> using music to make money. And then uh, I said yes to everything. I have a party. Yes. Uh, I have this uh, Persian uh, convention, yes. And so I started saying yes to everything that had the word music. And by the time I arrived in my second year of college, there was an audition for Lola Falana, which was a huge star in Vegas. And then I couldn't finish college. I had, and yeah. she was at the Aladdin, at the old Aladdin Hotel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was Aladdin. that still situated, Aladdin at the time, uh, across from where the Monte Carlo is or was? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And Were so, you familiar with any of the acts that came up in the early uh, millennium 2000s, like Clint Holmes and those guys? You know, oh, I know Clint Holmes. Since <laughs> I mean, Santa Fe and all those uh, bands. We were actually, I should write a book just on Vegas. Uh, Santa Fe, they were not allowed in the Strip. You know, and this is like, it gets pretty deep um, into Vegas history because in the 70s, no rock and roll was allowed in the Strip. Right. Basically, right I, saw, I saw Chicago, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Total, I mean, not total, uh, uh, Steely Dan with Jeff Procaro on drums and the oh, convention wow. center and the Ice Palace. Wow. And, oh that, and so basically uh, the, the strip was just, you know, Sinatra, Dean Martin, Tuxedo, uh, no rock and roll. And then, then little by little, uh, so Santa Fe, Clint Holmes, we were in outskirts of Las Vegas playing North Las Vegas and the clubs, funky clubs. And then little by little, uh, one of the first concerts was Shaka Khan at the Sahara Space Center. And the headlines the next day read, uh, Las Vegas ruined by this rock and rollers because black and white hippies arrive yeah. in the strip to go to this concert. So you had, you know, the kids with the afros and the white kids with the bell bottoms and the long hair going to see Shaka Khan. And I was there. And they basically were telling us that we were going to ruin Las Vegas. So now, at my age, I go to Las Vegas and I tell all these DJs that have no live bands, your guys are going to ruin Las Vegas with your DJs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at now. Now, look at DJs are rock stars. You could buy a $1,300 MacBook Pro and, you know, cock your headphones off to the side and make ten grand a party. Exactly. That's what I do. <laughs> exactly. yeah. so that's what i'm saying you guys are ruining las vegas but they used to tell me to my face the big band jazz musicians yep. you rock and rollers are gonna ruin well, with your groups well that's what they kind of told hal blaine like hal blaine was a jazzer right and so rock and roll was coming in and he was the one that was smart enough to embrace it and say i'm gonna play jimmy jimmy go go pop boom Bop, bop. He, he's played that all the way to the bank, right? And he was probably, what, one of the first, if not last, studio musicians in Los Angeles that would be able to have a Rolls Royce, a mansion, a boat. Yeah, you know? and they, that's, what, that's why they, they told not only Hal, but all of them, the wrecking crew, you guys are going to wreck this business. So they called themselves the wrecking crew. Here we go. Beautiful. Yeah, no. Hundreds of album and hit records. So you moved to Vegas. Now in 70, you're um, four, 14 years old, 13, 14 yeah. years old. So yeah. I mean, you look great. It's just proof. It's just proof that when you do something you love and you get up every day with a smile on your face, that affects your DNA, your biochemistry, your overall health. I mean, you're just so young at heart and you have this just great positive essence. You know, I'll, I'll sit next to you at the PAS. I saw your, your uh, clinic at the PAS and we were chatting backstage and you're making sure your timbales are tuned just right next to your kit. And it's just, I just got massive respect for you, man. The fact that you could speak two languages and then in the world of percussion, you could speak two languages because you can express yourself. 
effectively with your hands, and then you could pick up your sticks and then play rock and roll and fusion and country and funk. And there's not a lot of guys that can do both those things. It's very, very cool. Well, thank you, Rich. Coming from you, well, I, I throw all that back to you because, <laughs> I mean, and I'm not saying this because you're here and this is your show. I mean, I get a lot of inspiration from you because a lot of the things you say, I believe on the credo. Yeah. Uh, when you're, well, when you. I'm in my room here, you know, the other day I actually did a video in my pajamas, you know, <laughs> not even like wash my face, my hair was like that. So that's not the way I come on stage or into a recording studio with the band. So we're living in an era that is audio and visuals. And long time ago, the Wrecking Crew, you never saw them record unless somebody took, took a, a picture. Now there's always somebody filming HD. So you got to... You know, ever since MTV came in, uh, it's a different thing. So, you know, when you play, I see you play. I'm not going to – Santana actually uh, taught me something when I was with uh, touring with him. He goes, I see myself three-dimensional. And I said, well, what does that mean? He goes, well, I see myself from the inside as I see myself and hear myself, how you in front of me see me and hear me, and how the last guy on the showroom – is seeing me and hearing me. So when I come on stage, I want to make sure that sometimes you have to exaggerate because there's an audience that is yeah. far away. And so with that in mind, you know, you bring it all, you know what I'm saying? Together, and, sure. sure. And I mean, you, that's something that I say all the time. I say, I said yes to everything. And I actually still at this point in my career, I just turned the big... 5-0 and Joshua Tree this year. I went out to Joshua Tree, turned 5-0, kind of evaluated my life, looked at what I've accomplished, what I want to do. You make the gratitude list, smoochy smoochy with my girl. It was amazing. But looking back, it was like, it was from saying yes. Because every time you go out and you play brown eyed girl at some biker bar or you play some bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, so you're advertising your skill set. Someone's going to want to come up and talk to you, and that's probably going to lead to your next job. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, the other day, and I, I think this is like the same kind of theme, I was reading something about. Well, one makes a professional and an amateur musician, and they were saying, well, the professional musicians has their chops together, this and that. But the more I read, I disagree. You know, like, I, I see a lot of amateur drummers in Instagram that play circles around me. I mean, you know, so basically an amateur musician, you can play in your house all you want, whatever time you want, when you want to, and what you want to. The moment you become a professional musician is a personal choice to be of service ah. of somebody else's vision. So now, like you said, yes, how can I help you? Well, I need a triangle here and a bass room on the one. I'll bring it. I'll yeah. make your song shine. All right, you know, let's do it. I need a drum set. I need more heavy metal. And, you know, if I cannot do it, um, I'll call somebody else. Yeah. I'll recommend it other people. Uh, man, I just recommend it, by the way, Somebody wanted like a Pantera tune with like three bass drums and, you know, like a complete, like I recommended Achilles Priester because I was saying, this is the guy you want. Right now, I cannot do that. So yeah. uh, I, I would need too much time to actually get into that. So Yeah, I would call Achilles or, or Thomas Lang or, oh, you, yeah, know, yeah, one of, exactly. you know, one of these guys. <laughs> I mean, because Charlie. it was serious and, and he wanted like a humongous drum set. So, you know what, for me to put all that together, yeah, no. So, but, you know, I try to, to be of service means that you want to help. Like, for example, you're with uh, Jason Aldean and I'm with Chicago. So it's, it's about them. It's not about you. Oh, my God. I can't imagine. Well, well, in Chicago, you've covered both chairs. You were playing percussion, right? And Tris was playing drums. Tris and Bowden, you guys are longtime friends. And then... Now you're playing drums. Has it been six years already? Well, um, I started playing percussion in 2012. Ah. And in 2018, I started playing drums. Oh, two years. So it's yeah. been two years. And then, of course, this year doesn't count. Uh, I mean, three weeks in Vegas and we were sent home. Yep. Um, and um, so, you know, God willing, we'll start back again like May or June. I don't know. I know. So, 
sometime there. Um, it's exciting to think, hey, what is going to happen next year? None of us know. And so yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to frame it as well. That's kind of exciting. Let's just keep really busy and productive until the phone call comes and you're like, hey, we're going to do. 20 festivals between July and October, you know, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, you, know. you hope so. But meanwhile, this coronavirus have taught me, I should have started this thing that I have behind me, you know, the recording studio and yeah. Logic Audio or Pro Tools, whatever, 20 years ago. But, but the main, you know, but you're doing it. And that's the main thing is that you saw the writing on the wall and you're like, wow, I've got to do this. And you know, you're a world-class drummer and percussionist. The phone is going to ring. So all you have to do is let people know, I now have this available to do for you. And you know, talk about serving the song and making people happy. I was looking at some of the Lindsey Buckingham videos when you were touring with him, you're playing Roland V drums. That had to be different, yeah. right? Well, you would have done the same thing, I tell you, and you know, I tell you why, because that, that this is actually like a good point for all young drummers out there. So, you know, of course, this is me right there rehearsing with Lindsay, and we're rehearsing all the songs and all that. And, you know, he wanted cajon on some things and percussion on the acoustic things. And all of a sudden, he comes to me, man, and, and in the front of the drum set, and he goes, hey, Wally, you're not going to play drum set all night, are you? And I go, well, what do you mean? <laughs> he goes, well, you know, like I have like about 20 guitars, different sounds, and the keyboard has different patches, and we have different patches on guitar. So I want like a drum set for each song. Ah. I want like go your own way. It's got to sound like Mick. But then on this song, it's got to sound more tight. And, you know, so basically what he was saying, I got to have 13 drum sets. And so the only way to give him what he wanted, uh, remember, is that when you're a professional, it's not about what you want, it's what they want. Yeah. And me and uh, Lindsay sat and basically programmed every bass drum and every tom-tom and every snare that he loved for each song. And when it was all done, man, he was so grateful. And, yeah. and that's, you would have done the same thing. You would have sat there, Lindsay, what is it that you want? I want that one. Okay, that's the one then. Whoever. And so... Um, did you find uh, external samples or did you just go with all the internal sounds from Roland? No, we had... To, the, 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 at that time, it was the TD-30. Right. We actually mm. tweaked all the sounds. Of the, <sighs> we, like, we sat all one day at center staging. <laughs> put a pillow. How about the 24? How about the 22? Oh, How wow. about the 20? Oh, what about detune it? Boom. Oh, okay. I mean, it was like tedious work. But once we had that and we were on tour, that guy was hearing exactly what he wanted. Beautiful. Well, I use uh, live cymbals. And then some things were on percussion. And, and uh, uh, you know, out of tragedies, other things happened. Because we had, I worked with Lindsay from 2007 to 11. And in 11, we were in Christmas, and we were going to go on to 2012 until April. And our main guitar player had a problem in his back, and it was hurting. And basically, in Christmas, we were going to tour UK, and he couldn't get on the airplane, and we couldn't go to UK, and Lizzie decided to cancel the tour and go solo. And my friend, uh, Neil got an operation of titanium discs and oh, no. rates and is he okay now? Yeah, he's okay now. He's actually with Fleetwood Mac. He's, he's the one. bionic man. Yeah, he's actually the bionic man. So with that being said, so now Christmas 2011, I had until April and now I'm unemployed. Yeah. So I start calling everybody and I start doing every job, percussion, drums, this, this style, that style, salsa, Latin, recording and, and traveling, you know, with different groups, playing with El Chicano, and that's when the call came. My brother Danny was working with Zach Brown Band, but the percussionist that was with Chicago at the time, Drew Hester, was going to go into Joe Walsh position of drum set yes. player. And so he was leaving Chicago, so Danny came in to play percussion with Chicago, but he had to do Zach Brown, so he called me to do like a week a week or two, you know, on percussion. So I said, yeah, I'm happy, you know, three weeks with this guy, two weeks with Chicago on percussion. So I remember on the second show, 
I brought my Chicago two so everybody can sign it because just in case. That's so cute. You're just like still humble enough that you're playing in the band, you're making money, you're playing huge venues with this. You're like, guys, can you sign my record? Yeah, because it, after two weeks, that was it. Yeah. It was going to be a two week engagement. And then it's like, thank you very much. And then I did my job and whoever was going to come back or whatever. But on the third show, Robert Lamb came inside the, the dressing room and said, hey, Wally, um, you know, I know Danny's busy with Zach Brown Band and all that, but if you want to hop on the bus and stay with us, you sound like you've been with us forever. I goes, well, I've been with, I've been with you forever. I remember La Judy Oliveira playing percussion. I saw you guys in 74 in Las Vegas. I've been following Chicago. That was my first album I bought. Yeah, your first album was Chicago Transit Authority, right? Yeah, I mowing lawns. I, I bought, uh, it was 10 bucks, something like that. And I You hear that, it. kids? You're mowing lawns, and I raked leaves, and I shoveled snow, and I walked uphill oh, yeah. to school. And <laughs> yeah, and in Puerto Rico, that was my, my, my pocket money. You know, I mow the lawns in the neighbors, you know, with the old lawnmower. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and I got paid and I went to Jemco, the store, and bought Chicago Transit Authority and Disraeli Gears uh, cream. And yeah. so, and then Robert Lamb basically hired me back uh, right there on the spot. And I guess that was the contract. You want to hop on the bus, Gus? Yeah. <laughs> and then what happened to Tris? Like when he gave up the drum set position? Well, that was a, 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 a long story, and it's a... I don't know if I'm supposed to be asking the question. It, well, I don't know. you know, what, what happened was uh, it was a mixture of a lot of things, but, you know, Tris had remarried. Oh, yes. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, Tris was with the band like 28 years. Yeah, that's a good run. Yeah, so, and then the bass player at the time was higher, but then, you know, he never was on the road. Like, we, we actually do seven to eight months in and out. In and out. In and out, seven to eight months. So basically we got November, December, and maybe a little bit of January. And the rest of the time, it's like, you know, we do four weeks, but go home for one and go back. And, and so I think that the scheduling, uh, it just didn't work out for what was happening. And then Tris resigned, and so did uh, Jeff. And then uh, this guy's moved on. So basically I, I didn't know what was going to be happening, to tell the truth. I... I'm the percussionist with the band. Whatever you guys decide, I don't know if Danny was going to come back or they were talking this or Tris was going to come back. And yeah. I don't know. I know. Well, I mean, once you have Wally in your band, you got to have him in the band because you are you just light it up, right? And then Ramon Islas comes along, right? He's your percussionist. Well, yeah, right? that, that was a little after. That yeah. happened a similar way. So the, the word was in November of 2008, 17. I love that you well, remember these dates. I can't remember yesterday. Yeah, because that's when the whole evolution, <laughs> the whole change happened. Yeah, yeah. And he's the uh, Lee came in and says, Wally, you ready? You're going to be playing drums. And I go, okay. And, you know, none of this is for sure. It's like maybe I'm back on percussion. As, you know, it's basically what is it that you need? That's yeah. my... I, I, I'm I'm here for you. Well, you, you, you have want? twice the, the ability to be gainfully employed at any time, because you could play drums or percussion, drums and percussion, right? I mean, that's like, that's why I tell kids, buy a damn shaker and a tambourine and a cajon and a djembe. You buy all those things, you're still way under $500. And that investment will pay itself back so quickly because you'll do coffee house jobs, you'll do overdubs. Someone will see you play percussion and go, I love your feel. I love your vibe. Do you play drum set too? It's twice the amount of chances. Marketability. I agree 100%. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm glad you got the gig. I mean, you look so comfortable. I love the fact that if you go to your website, is it WalfredoReyesJr.com? WalfredoReyesJr.com. Perfect. Yes. You check it out. You click on the media section. There are so many videos. And you put a camera right above your ride symbol when you play with, uh, with Chicago. And you could see you play all those amazing 25 to 6 to 4 Saturday in the park. Yeah, that's got to be amazing to play those songs, right? I mean. Oh, yeah. I mean, people all the time ask me, what's your favorite song? Well, through the eras, they all have been. Because, you know, just like like you're playing right now say like with jason aldean and basically there was somebody that was older when jason aldean started the career but then you know through the years there's different era so uh, you know i was a kid when beginnings came on the radio yeah 
and it really affected me. Every time I hear that acoustic guitar, I get goosebumps, goosebumps. even on stage. But then later on in the 80s, I was, uh, and, you know, in relationships and getting married, you know, and so that was a whole different era. You know? Wally, how many marriages? Uh, you're on your third third marriage okay so if i get married again that'll be three for me we'll have six between us my band's got 13 marriages i can't imagine how many marriages are in chicago you should you should add it up well that's a very good question and you know okay that's my there. assignment yeah that's my challenge to you oh, <laughs> you know the other day i actually uh, had a situation where uh i remember i was going through my first divorce and i talked about it in a group with students and recently that student is going through the same thing many 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 years after sure. and he remembered what i said you know it's very difficult for us people think that this is like really a glamorous business yes of course it is but it's a part-time glamorous business because uh, like alex acuna told me one time he goes hey alex you're playing with al Jarreau. how's it going he goes man the limo picked me up at home Took me to the airport, first class. I went to New York, played a Radio City Music Hall, Walder of Astoria. Then they picked me up, took me home in the limo. I arrived, the door opened, and my wife says, honey, the kids need diaper change. Can you please take out the garbage? You forgot to take it out. It's stinking right now. And yep, that's that. the rock star taking out the garbage and changing diapers. Woo! Waldorf Astoria, I've never stayed there, but I've had the salad, you know, of the Waldorf salad so many times. Oh, yeah. What I gotta say right now is this. I, Wally, I want to see Jim wearing your shirt at some point. I just, I think this <laughs> could be a new happen. direction for you. If you guys are just listening to this interview, Wally has this, he's always very colorful and he's got this very, very loud shirt on that matches his very outgoing personality. And I think that Jim would mm. crush it. Let's bring it out. <laughs> Is that silk? No, no. These are shirts that basically you can, you know, it's just like, you know, you see that, that, the cover of that bass drum. Yeah, there's a very, very colorful bass drum head. If you guys are just listening to this, Wally's got a very colorful DW drum set. Yeah, so this this whole graffiti bass drum started with, of course, when I was with David Lindley, and it was like, uh, you know, an original paint job and all sure. that. And then I, uh, the shirts, basically, it's just like, I just love the colorful shirt. So it doesn't have to be expensive. Some of them, but believe it or not, when I go to Marshalls or TJ Maxx, you'll find a good I, one go around you never know and once you never in a while, know bam there they are and sometimes they're like a uh, robert graham and some of the more expensive shirts that are brought down from like 300 to like less than 100 yeah. yeah you know that's the expensive ones yeah because sometimes they're like they're they've got like a little imperfection in them somewhere but no one's right. gonna know and you saved like you know a third of the amount that's you know yeah that's and well, i just want to point out rich that uh i got mud on my slip-ons <laughs> Jim, I'm always I'm making fun of, of Jim's shoes and he's such bad he's shoes. such a good sport. He had dad <laughs> shoes. He's such a dad. He's got a great family. Oh, just we we go Jim and I go way back. He's kind of like my muse. You know, and usually a muse is a female, but uh, you know, I'm not trying to get in trouble here. I, I like look, Jim as my muse. Look, well, three words <laughs> three words that drive that drive women nuts are slip on shoes, okay? <laughs> Right? No? What do you drum in, Wally, uh, for shoes? Boots? Chuck Taylors? Man, you wouldn't believe. I mean, I've been trying to get an endorsement because all I'm using now is like, you know, they, they didn't used to be hip, but now they are Skechers. Okay. Right. Well, Ringo was a Skechers guy for a bit there. No, really? Yeah. Have you he was like, out to him? Yeah. No. I, I, well, I tried on Instagram and all that. You know, they have this cushion mattress kind of like, yeah, and you slip it on whether you have socks or not. And I play and it feels like I'm playing drums, jumping on my mattress, you know. Yeah. Nice. Go after him, man. You know, reach out to him. Because, I mean, that, if I were a company like that, I would jump all over it. Well, I, I, I might. I might one day. I, I just have a collection and I realized that all I have on my uh, wardrobe case and, and even here in town, uh, right now I have them on. You know, this is like the Skechers. Nice. Yeah, They're man. Slip ons too. These are Skechers. I, really? I, I, man, we got to write them. I, I, I have spent like 30 something years playing in Chuck Taylors and I try to break away. I keep coming back to them. I know they're not good for your, you know, because there's not a whole lot of support there. 
so I'll try wearing like super hip boots, you know, but they make sounds on the pedals, the, the, wow. the, the heels, you know, the soles. The boot, what the, uh, the chucks? No, like, like, fat, like really like, like fry boots, like big masculine boots that look good when you're in a rock band or something. But they I just made one noise. time I used to bring my own shoes to a gig and there were wrestling shoes. That was, those were awesome to play. In. Yeah. Very uncomfortable to watch it, but man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Jim, did you ever see Wally in any of the, because uh, over the years, I mean, he's played in so many different groups. Wally, tell me, confirm this for me. I think I saw you at the Lubbock Coliseum in Lubbock, Texas, touring with Santana in 1989. Does that sound right? Lubbock, Texas, yes. Yes, I saw you there. You I was in the audience, show? and you had flowing locks of curly hair. Right. I remember Lubbock, Texas, because we got in trouble. What happened? <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> These are the stories you listen to the Rich Redman show said, for. The stars at night. Oh, my God. Well, what happened was, you know, um, uh, this is like confession. I mean, I, I hope, like, I don't get in trouble for this myself. Uh, you know, I remember it was like a, at a, like a, a sporting Coliseum kind of place, Lubbock. And our, our guy that used to do the video, Carlos used to hire a video guy to video every sound check, every concert. So you were on the spot, even when, when you sat on your drums, started messing around, that was on video. Yeah. So what happened is, um, the night before he went out partying and went out to, a a stripper bar and invited the whole club to come to the concert. Wow. Be <laughs> yeah, because Lubbock is a dry county. You have to leave the city limits to go get alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it so was fun. crazy. I mean, so then like we're like we're sound checking because, you know, like unlike Chicago, we don't sound check. We actually arrive at the gig, do meet and greet, play the show and leave. So Which do you pr prefer? Do you prefer doing a sound check or would you say I like it the well, other way? Ah, that's a very difficult question. I prefer the sound check if we're going to jam and maybe record and, and write something. Like, for example, Little Village, Ry Cooter once told me that that was the sound checks. The sound checks from Little Village was like the, their albums. Yeah. You know, they, and, uh, well, Some people use sound check as a creative, more than just checking the instruments in front of house. It's a time for the band to connect and gel and, exactly. and maybe come up with things. And yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a long time, but just an idea and somebody records it and then you go out to, to eat, but Chicago doesn't. So like, basically we arrive, I sometimes have to go earlier to, to check my drums. Yeah. But, you know, I basically trust my, my tech all the way, just sit, play and go. And I love so, it when uh, that happens, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, with Santana, we were jamming, and all of a sudden, here comes my man with, like, 14, like, you know, girls, and we're like, what the hell's going on? So, of course, that night after the show, it was like a big party, and everybody got in trouble. So <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Let's leave so, it at that. I didn't know that, but so you got the band got in trouble in Lubbock, Texas, but I was there in the audience for sure, and you were just slaying, like, how old would you what have you been in 1998? Uh, no, this would have been 1989. Yeah, yeah, so that was either 1989 or 90 something. You were, like you were like like 32 years old or something. Yeah, yeah, man, killing it. So uh, you know, it's just you know, I started when I was in high school. The other day, kind of brought tears to my eyes because. Um, uh, uh, a bass player that used to be a kid in Las Vegas now is head of the union, the musicians union. So I called him up and I couldn't believe he was in the union. He goes, man, I just want to know when did I join the union in Las Vegas? Man, he sent me this card. 1973, I was in high school, a junior in high school, and my dad went to co-sign to be in the musicians union and I have to have a sheriff's card additional to go into the alcoholic place as a minor to work professional on the strip. But it was all like my signature and then my dad, you know, like, yeah, I co-signed for him. That's cool. And that was like, that, I almost feel like almost like framing it. You know what I'm saying? That sheriff's card thing is really tricky out there. My wife had to, you had to get the sheriff's card, uh, but you had to show an interest from a place to hire you. Right. In order to get the sheriff's card. And then in order, in order for a place to hire you, 
you had to have a sheriff's card. <laughs> I was like, where do I go here? Yeah, it's like your SAG card, yeah. <laughs> My wife went through that with massage therapy out there. Yeah, that, that's true. That's correct. Uh, it's very, they make it very difficult, and yeah. if you survive, then you get the sheriff card. Yeah. You know, but yeah, like, so Las Vegas, of course, it was a different, when were you there uh, in Las Vegas? 01 to 05, I worked for uh, CBS radio out there. I was uh, actually wondering, you may know somebody, we may have a mutual friend out there, uh, Heidi Harris. Does that ring a bell? Well, that rings a bell. Does it? Yeah. You I know, I left in 1980. I moved to LA because, you know, in, in Las Vegas at that time, I was working a lot of musicians coming in. Alex Acuna came in and he was mm. living in Las Vegas played at the whole, uh, showroom at the Hilton for like mm -hmm. Elvis and all that. And then eventually he got hired to go with Weather Report. So yeah. he moved to LA and, you know, he was one of my teachers. And then uh, Luis Conte used to come in a lot with the Supremes and Diana Ross. And then he was in LA. And then when mm -hmm. I started in college, uh, I went to do a music festival in LA, an Orange County Jazz Festival. And the guy that was before me in the Eagle Rock High School Band was Carlos Vega. Ah, oh, so I uh, he, he, he left us too soon, man. I know. What was he, like 40 years old or something? I, I, man, I remember it was like in the 90s when this happened. And, and But, you know, like at that time, it was really weird because I, you know, I was looking at the band from Eagle Rock High School and he was playing this symbol. It sounded like John Guerin's case symbol. And I went backstage and go, man, that symbol you have is like, like John Garrett said, he goes, man, you got a ear because I got, I had a lesson with him and I bought the symbol. Wow. <laughs> and so I went like, wow. So we exchanged numbers. And when I moved to Las Vegas, I called him up. And by, at that time he was already working uh, for Sean Cassidy. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so then he, um, he did, you know, he was recording in the studio already, but he did this one-off recording that happened to be this song for Olivia Newton-John. It was physical. Let's get physical, <laughs> physical. Come on. And it was huge, and he was in, like, big time. You so know? that was Carlos Vega. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, like, you know, just it goes to show. Like, I don't know if we had the kind of medication that we do now for people that are depressed, but he was depressed, I think. And Yeah, it was, it yeah. was a, a mixture of um, – so, you know, he, he – yeah, I mean – from what I know, you know, he uh, got married, had a beautiful family, had two beautiful girls. And um, I think he was trying to like quit, quit cold blooded, you know, because like when you actually are a single guy, you do what you do, whether it's alcohol or some pot, whatever. Pot was pot back then. It was like, uh, no, like, da, da, da. but you know, right now it's even more acceptable. But back then he does, didn't want to see it around the house, nothing around the house. And then he was trying to like quit all that cold turkey. And that's, I think, when it really he got uh, happened, yeah. when the yeah. incident happened that he just shot himself and he didn't show up for the James Taylor gig at the airport. You know, yeah. everybody was there. And, uh, you know, I went to the funeral, man, and that was like a, a huge funeral. And I was just basically devastated because um, there was an incident there. Um, you know, my, my real mom died when I was five in Cuba from uh, oh. um, the, my birth mother. So I was five. She was 26. Uh, she had typhus fever, and they gave her this medication. It was like too much medication, and that killed her. Wow. And so That's when nice. Carlos Vega's funeral, the two daughters and the wife came to say something in the podium, and the little girl was hanging to her mom's uh, leg. You know, she was five. And then I, that really hit me. So when I got home, I asked my dad, how, how uh, did I went to my mother's funeral? And I, he said, yeah, you were there. They have no memory, no recollection. So that really hit me hard, you know, when Carlos Vega's daughters were there. And I wonder if they remember that moment. But yeah, he left us too soon. You're right. Yeah. What, what, a, what a legacy. I mean, we just had Robin Flans on and she wrote the book on Jeff. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, she had a very special relationship with him and all the people that, uh, that she interviewed in the book, they were all so cooperative. It's a, it's a great book. It's, I read it in one sitting, you know? Yeah. I need to, to read it because Robin interviews so many people and Jeff Percaro was another one. Jeff 
of course, recommended Carlos when he couldn't do. Actually, you know, Jeff recommended me to go with Boss Cax, and I didn't know that until we were walking in Japan together. And, and I asked Boss, like, how did you hear from me? And, and I thought it was from another gig and boss said well jeff gave me your name and go what yeah that's great that's always great look at this i don't know if you ever checked out your wiki but there's there's like this beautiful timeline that somebody did through the years it's like a chart and the, and these are the artists and it shows the exactly when you were with those artists and the overlap between each gig starting from did that uh, it's he's amazing he's a who did drummer, it? a rudimental drummer oh wow that is part of the wiki leak things you know WikiLeaks is very amazing because you cannot just put anything there. It has to be, you know, like I cannot, that picture that is there, well, yeah. Lincoln Congas, he took. So I've been on his case sending him a text. Hey, man, can I put another photo there? Because, well, it has to be certified. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. This is The Rich Redman Show. I got like a pretty strong, you know, Google presence, right? And so I've, you know, I've always invested in having a great website. Your website is great. I was like, why don't, how come I don't have a wiki? And then somebody that I know was like, oh, I'm really tight with the wiki people. He made me a wiki and I finally have a wiki. But then there's, it's, it's really interesting. It's like, who can edit it? Is it anyone? Because then yeah. there could be some false information on there. So it's be careful what you wish for. <laughs> You know, you're absolutely right, because uh, I, I was told, you know, with Chicago, like all bands, you know, there's like, you know, like there's a lot of people that are unhappy that it's 2020 and not 1976. And I'm sorry, you know, so like with Chicago, just like with Santana, just like with Lindsey Buckingham, you know, you get what you get, like comparisons and haters and lovers. And it's like that for everything. So, you know, luckily for me, you know, I do the best job I can and people, most people like it. But once in a while you get somebody that is hating you because you're not Danny Serafin or mm -hmm. they're a Tris in Bowdoin and you're not Tris. And I'm going, yeah, I cannot be Tris. But, you know, with that being said, you know, I, those are two friends. Like I, we, we drummers, they don't understand. We talk to each other. I talk to Santana drummers before me and after me and we have like a groove there and we we inspire each other and help each other yeah and drummers were like that and the other day a guitar player told me he goes man we guitar players don't do that he goes oh drummers do that i mean yeah we have our own conventions exactly <laughs> <laughs> and drum no bad circles. blood no nothing yeah <laughs> we have drum we had, circles um, too i would imagine <clears throat> the singer of all th of all people must get a lot of flack. I mean, it's he's singing the Peter Cetera songs that are s such a staple. Yeah. Oh, yeah. he gets bombarded just like Jason did, yeah. and uh, you know because uh, he he doesn't play bass. So uh, the bass player bef uh, that we had before, uh, he played jazz Jason. Hockey. Yeah. Yeah, but then uh, after Jeff, and then be and Jason played bass. So we didn't have time to find the perfect after jeff coffee uh a perfect bass player singer that plays in that register so um uh neil was already singing with uh chicago and he's he actually does voiceover dubs he sings in all styles in toronto canada and so now we have a bass player and a singer but the music is covered you know the main thing is to cover those parts high parts and one yeah. time that robert lamb got sick he took over and did all of Robert Lamb's uh, lead parts. So he's a very versatile guy, lead. Yeah, because your your bass player yeah. now is um, Brett, uh, Brett Simon. Yeah, Brett. Okay, yeah. so Brett Brett's doing that, and then because I know Jeff, I know Jeff Coffee very well because he's a friend of our band and is always coming through Nashville to write songs. And yeah, it's it's a small okay. small world. You know, and these guys. 
what people don't realize, they're, they're all great. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's like, it's Chicago. It, you know, what do you want to do? Like, you want me to, oh, you're not happy. So I'm, let me talk to Robert Lamb for you because you're not happy. We're going to make a big change. You know, it's not my fault. What, what was I going to do uh, um, when Lee and Robert and Jimmy came to me and says, Wally, we want you to play drums. I go, oh, no, I can because there's going to be unhappy people out there. <laughs> no, it's take the job. Happen. No, yeah. it's got to get done. Exactly. So, so that will always happen. And and when my daughter Liliana, uh, she did a little video one time for LP. She's not a percussionist per se. She went to USC and as a vocalist. So she sings, but they kind of like pushed her into playing percussion, and she's doing an amazing job. But that was not her first thing. She actually added value to her job. So all of a sudden, she did this little LP thing, just playing a groove and singing. And she got bombarded with criticism and trolls and stuff like that. And it's like, she's not Giovanni and she's not uh, Mongo Santa Maria. And she never claimed to be. So I told her, I went to uh, Michael Jackson, which has millions. And then you have the thumbs up a million mm -hmm. something. And there was always like yeah. One 750, haters yeah like so there you go if you're not getting haters you're not doing something right yeah jim exactly. says if you have haters you're on track with yeah. something you know <laughs> haters know. bring them on ding you dong. just you just accept it like like on youtube you know it's like i, I what do I, I think i have like 600 videos on youtube that i've put up there like how to's behind the scenes sound checks like you throw the camera up over my shoulder let people yeah. feel what it's like to see like 80,000 people in a stadium. It's just a fun... Anybody can play yeah. this way. Well, thank Anybody man, yeah, can go just, in the studio and do this. Oh, Keep yeah, this guy, this guy sucks. Anybody <laughs> can do that. But then Anybody you just... Can play. just you just got to say, piece. man, you're not doing it, though. You're, yeah. you're, you haven't put a life together for you yourself. Something. Yeah. You know, when yeah. you get into the studio and you're under that kind of pressure, all right, just the other day, Rich, I was just telling you, I was trying to teach my son uh, who was going through band in school... He's got an app now because we're doing everything from home that listens to your playing. So as he's doing his practice pad stuff, it records the notes and measures the accuracy within the time. Ouch. So if you miss it by just a minuscule amount red, and he, he couldn't get past a 60. So yeah. I'm like, okay, let me, let me try this out. I couldn't get past the 60. <laughs> I was like, oh, this I think is there's humbling. a lot of professional drummers that are like, that are feel guys, right? Yeah. That oh, some, yeah that they would have even less than a 60 because they put the verse back, they move yeah. the chorus. You know what I mean? This is looking as like a, just a snap ones and zeros matrix. <laughs> right, well, it's right. It's funny because I called you up and I asked, uh, my, the reason why I was calling Rich was because there was a Z notation above the quarter note. I'm going, yeah. what the heck is a Z? I think it's like a press roll. Zap. That's what we decided. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, this is, you know, that's the reason why I was calling you. But you, you know, you're right. I love the videos that you actually have. Like it makes uh, it, it's like the feeling because a lot of people that even pay a lot of money, they get that view, but they don't get the view from you looking that yeah. way. Yeah. And they love it. I mean, you know, you're. Uh, I, I really appreciate the videos that you put out there because I'm. Oh, you know, thanks. one of the things. One of the things that I love you. you uh, a bit, I love about you. I mean, aside from many uh, other things, it's like uh, the motivational to give, you know, people that are not doing maybe what we're doing, but you're giving them an inspiration and a motivation. And I'm, I'm telling you sometimes, and I put one the other day on my Instagram with a face like this, like, <laughs> and I did that on purpose because I was having a bad day. I truly, truly had a day like this. Like I, I sat on my drums, my logic was not working. I was doing a stupid mistake and couldn't send the files. I had a nightmare and then I, I sat on the drums to practice, like I did something that I could do last year and forever, and I couldn't do it. So I sat on the drums and I just basically didn't have anything to say. So uh, like Miles Davis said, when you don't have nothing to say, don't say nothing. And right. so basically I got up from the drums and I changed my mental channel. I had needed more inspiration. Sure. I took a walk. 
I saw the birds, the trees, the leaves, this and that, changed the channel, took a walk to the levee. Then I came home, I opened up my Instagram, and there's like you, and there's like Ash Stone, and there's Eric Moore, and this and that, chop drummers, field drummers, this and that. That gave me some energy and inspiration. So sure. just because you think you're putting a post just because you're doing, no, you, like I told this to Ash Stone the other day. Sometimes I really lose it, man. I just want to shut this logic audio and I'm not a studio engineer. And then I see song, uh, Ash and he's going, or one of your videos. It sounds amazing. I'm going like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to try again. Or well, hey. I am not an engineer either, man. I, I'm lucky. I have my drum tech from the last 10 years and he comes over and I say, look it, I would rather get this song done today and just come up with a great drum part and have it be infectious and passionate and you handle Pro Tools and I will pay you. You know what I mean? But I mean, I would, lo I would love, I, uh, I would love to be a studio rat. I would love to be one of these guys that literally goes into the room for 12 hours and experiments with mic placement and changes snare drums and gaffs up their drums and like, you know, like uh, Aaron Sterling and some of these like mad yeah. scientist guys. Right. I love it. I just, I, I like playing music with people in the room, you know, it's, well, it's, I, I was that guy until this COVID-19 because yeah. then I realized uh, I have an amazing studio engineer and, and, and a church that he bought down my street. It's an incredible, he has two studio rooms, Ashley Shepard, but I couldn't be with him and he couldn't come here. So that's when I decided to start lessons and all that. So now I got two young people. One of, it is, one of them is a studio engineer named Mia, which she looks like she's in the eighth grade. And the other one is uh, a kid in North, <laughs> North Kentucky University studying for an audio degree, and he's a drummer. Perfect. And they're my teachers. Yeah. You know, so uh, I said, I need some young kids to teach me this. Stuff. But what a bargain. They get to be around your 40 plus years of intense experience with some of the greatest musicians in the world, you know? So I, yeah, man, and... God dang, you're so good, man. Like, one thing I noticed about your playing is this would never work for somebody who was, like, really stiff and staccato and playing on a modern-day snare line with the fiberglass heads, you know. Da, 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 da. But say you want to play a bunch of, like, E's and uh's, like, got, 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 got. You keep the right hand going, like, in the air so the motion is there, and then you're really loose, and you just, you just pull out E's and uh's, and it just helps you – keep the time while you're doing the E's and us, and then you have the ability to like warp that. So if you want, instead of like, triplets, you know, the, the Samba thing, there's just so much in stuff that's coming out of you, the Cuban stuff, the Puerto Rican stuff, the South American stuff. And I remember talking to you also about, um, you said, I paid all this money to send my daughter to USC. I should have just got her their percussion tutor app. <laughs> and then I went and got the crazy? percussion tutor app. That thing is awesome. If anybody is listening out there, it's a bunch of guys. I don't know how much money they to put into developing this thing, but they have a video of you of themselves playing this, uh, like an, an ethnic rhythm. It's written out for you. And then you can add a click to it or, and, or you can mute various parts of it. So if like in a samba, you can mute the shaker, you can mute the kashishi, you can mute the surdo. And it's, it's incredible. I love it. You really turned me on to that, man. I love that thing. And I think it's one of the best app there is because what they've done with it, the interactive. So I use it all the time for teaching, you know, and um, what you said, basically what I got that from my dad, by the way, because I saw him do it. And so basically anybody can do it. Like if you actually, I, I teach, for example, I'm talking about really, really basic. So you say like a, a, a paradiddle, right? Paradiddle, paradiddle. So now you got in the pad, it sounds like that, 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 that. When you put it on a tom tom and a snare, is do ga do do ga do ga do ga ga. Now you lift, lift your right hand up and you go ah, 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 ah. So now that's the syncopation, but you're still playing a paradiddle, but you're playing air drumming. Yeah. So taka taka toko 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 taka ta taka taka go 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 ka 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 you know what I'm saying? So yeah, just ghost notes, but yeah. mastering ghost notes. Yeah, ghost notes, and I call it subtract, add, subtract. So you're you're doing it with accents, rebounds, 
Uh, and I, I actually enjoy teaching. Aside from the recording, I, I started teaching online from here, but I still teach at a place where it's very social distancing. A friend of mine, Bobby Sharp, here in Cincinnati. And I really love teaching because uh, sometimes it, it forces me to know what the hell is it that I'm doing when they <laughs> ask me the question. The other day I had Bobby Shar himself. He goes, what is that that you're doing? And to tell the truth, I had no idea until we wrote it. And I realized, oh, my God, it's a five against four. I had no idea. So I had to write it down. I'll send it to you. And it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. But oh, it's I like a dot, got it, got it, got yeah, no, it's it's like uh, like a got got to do got to got to do. So basically, ta to ta to do. So it's one two three four five one two three four five. But on on, on triplet. So if you're doing ta to ta to ta to ta to ta ta to ta to ta to ta to ta 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 and then resolves, but I had no idea that it was five. So that's when Bobby went, wait a second, you're not doing triplets, you're doing fives. Mm -hmm. I am? Really? <laughs> <laughs> so so what, what, about, uh, what about your recording? You have a, a massive body of work. And even like TV and film, when I was going down the rabbit hole of like researching you, I, it was like, it was like Wally Day on YouTube. Look at all this. Uh, Jungle to Jungle, The Long Kiss, Good Night, Pretty in Pink, um, Mississippi Burning, huge films when you were in Los Angeles. Yeah. Were those like big reading gigs? Or like, or, yes. Yeah. So you're just reading through composed, fully transcribed drum set music. Yeah, that's when you will not have that cappuccino before the session. So if it was <laughs> like, you know, you're ready, you're ready, uh, your adrenaline. And those... You know, it's a, it's an era that I don't know if it still exists, but I know that a lot of the mute movie industry changed and a lot of home studios are used now. Yeah. Uh, even before I left LA, I was having Michael Convertino that did actually uh, uh, one of those films, the Vanessa Williams uh, dance or something dance like that. Dance with me? Dance with me, yeah, Vanessa yeah. Williams. So it was like a lot of percussionists on the studio uh, and actually... Puff Daddy was on the next one, just one beat the whole time. The whole time we did this whole soundtrack, he was just going, poof, bah, boom, boom, bah. every time we go and get a coffee, I would hear the same thing. Boom, boom, bah, boom, boom. And I'm going, wow, that's amazing. Like we've, we've done a whole movie soundtrack on percussion and they're still on one beat. Uh, so like um, the next session that I did for him, it was at his house. Yeah. So he bypassed that whole uh, studio thing. So, uh, so with, with that being said, like you know, those gigs are like in that in those days, it was like, well, Fred Reyes goes, yes, this is um, I forgot the service they used, and uh, eight o'clock at Universal, uh, blah blah blah. They go, yeah, I can do it. Okay, see you there. Double session, meaning one in the morning, and then you take a break and you come back, or single session, three hours. And then you go, and then I say, what, what's the instrumentation? He goes, don't worry, Emil Richards has everything, or yeah. Joe Porcaro will have everything. Just bring yourself. So when I arrive, there's like three or four percussionists. Emil gets the cartridge. The, the, the bill. Yeah, he gets the... Uh, or, yeah. He gets to rent his instruments to the movie studio. Exactly. And but, a lot God, of people, but God rest his soul. So Emil's gone. Joe is gone. Right, I saw this video of you with uh, at this place, LA Percussion Rentals. Is that still? Oh, yeah. Is that still around? They've got like the oh, yeah. stuff for scary movies, like you know the all the crazy instruments that are used in yeah. horror films. So you know, of course, Emil Richard was an inspiration to um, uh, LA Percussion Rentals, and uh, and they actually acquire many of Emil's instruments. Oh wow! Yeah. So he's a really dedicated guy. So yeah, they rent a lot of stuff that is unusual or. And uh, Amos Warehouse, which I went there one time, I, I one one little recollection. So one time we were looking at all these instruments Amos had, and there was like a giant cuica, you know, like a Brazilian cuica. But, but it was like a big, big, like trash can with a big rod in the middle. <laughs> and I'm going, damn. This That's is like King Kong's cuica. Exactly. So uh, Amos says, well, 
you know what this is? And he goes, well, it's a giant quicker with a trash can. He goes, well, he put a, 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 a glove, you know, like a gardening glove. Sure. And he went, when uh, there was a movie that was being made and John Williams came to me, uh, the composer John Williams, and he wanted some crazy sounds for this character. And he goes, okay. He goes, well, the character is almost like an ape and he's really big and furry. And Emil goes, okay, so like it's got to be like like an ape. And he goes, yeah, but it's got to be more unique. So ape went like with this giant quicker. He went, it was Shabaka. Wait a minute. Emil Richards' quicker is the sound of Chewbacca? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, the first Star Wars movie it was like and that was like uh, that and john williams went to amel for to look for sounds for different sounds effects and all that so when he told me that i went like oh my god i can't believe it it was that is amazing. insane i mean no. and and that's the kind of thing i hopefully if the paperwork is right amel's family is will still get checks from that because i mean he oh, did the, yeah. bum, bum. <laughs> I mean, now, so is like, that common knowledge to people. I mean, that's such part of fan trivia. I love Star Wars. I didn't know that. Yeah, and the other one that he told us himself, uh, because I I did it. You know, I was like really young back then, and I was like really nervous. And, and he goes, "Oh man, I think I messed up this thing. It was like really hard thing." He goes, "Well, let let, let let's see if uh, we can do it again." He goes, and then he told me this. He goes, "Wally, back then there was a." a uh, writer named Lalo Schifring. Sure. And he had this thing. It was, you know, basically nobody knew if the series was going to go or the music was going to make it or nothing. It's just, it's, it's in the air. And then all of a sudden they had this theme. Then Amos did it on the bongos and he messed up. And then he went, oh, geez, I messed up. And then it's like, okay, let's go on, let's go on. So he came to Lalo Schifring and goes, man, I did that. Can we do it again? He goes, I don't know, Amos. You know, like we... We got to run because we don't have too much time. We're on a budget. Oh, no. And uh, he goes, I ah, just let me do it. He goes, okay, let's do this one more time, you know, for Amol. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they did it again. All times. And it's like, don't, 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 don't. It's actually in 5 4. Sure. And then. Emil said, can you imagine if that thing would have played 30, 40, 50 years? Incorrectly? Incorrectly. I would have had to every time the movie came on, there I am with a mistake I made. You know, so oh, yeah. like, uh, yeah. like, you know, it's. Yeah, that, it's forever, man. But that that's really exciting. That's like one part of my career. That's why I live part-time in Los Angeles because somehow, by the grace of God, hopefully my prayers will be answered, I want to play on some TV and film scores. I think it would be so fun because my reading is good. You know, I remember talking last year to Alex Acuna and I go like, I like, who are the guys? Is it, do you go in like with, who does these Marvel movies? Like Jim's a huge Marvel guy. He's seen like every 32 films like a million times and 23. yeah 23 films and uh and he goes he goes uh bernie dressel bernie dressel yeah. plays on everything because he plays all styles and he reads really well and they work a lot together yeah. and i was like wow man that is i would love to just be the guy you know like playing triangle i mean i think i think it would be so cool well you know rich you never know it the, it, it has changed through the years and i'm old enough to tell you that like when i went in in the 1980 it was steve schaefer Sure. Is Steve still around, right? Is he a New York guy, right? No, L.A. He lives in L.A.? Oh, well. oh my God. Steve yeah. Schaefer, as far as drum set, yeah. did all, like with Larry Bunker, Joe Porcaro, Emil Richards, and then on the Latin percussion would be uh, Alex Acuna and Paulino da Costa, and then sometimes Luis Conte. Sometimes they had more guys added, so I came in as a Len Lenny Castro. Guy. Lenny Castro, uh, yeah. Lenny yeah. played also in some of some, but Lenny was more like doing pop rock stuff. And sometimes uh, he came in on some when they needed a lot of Latin percussion. Like there was a session like that one with Vanessa Williams. It was myself, Alex Acuna, Luis Conte, Efrain Toro. Walter Rodriguez, Lenny Castro. It was a party. Oh, my I God. Mean, like we we were jamming the whole time, and I think that guy recorded 20 minutes and then kept the other two hours of playing. 
and he probably sampled everything. But, um, you know, the thing is that it changes through the eras. Bernie is an amazing reader, uh, and he's a great drummer. Uh, I mean, we actually used to exchange a lot of gigs together, but Bernie was in Family Guy, one of the few TV shows that was live. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so now uh, Bernie, and then it'll be a, a day that, you know, like somebody else comes into the scene. But I have to say that it was not like it used to be that every day there was a recording in a studio with a band and an orchestra. Yeah. When that happens these days, it's big special. budget. It's like, oh my God, I have a session with more than five people. That, that's, that's like a blessing. Because with that being said, I've done sessions for different soundtrack kind of things in home studios. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, more, it's more efficient. It's more affordable. We just had on uh, Greg Bissonette, uh, your pal, and he said, uh, it was so funny. He and Vinny did the Born Supremacy. So it was two you know, two drummers or, or maybe he was subbing for Vinny and he said it was really intense and odd meters and tons of reading. And then he said, by the time all the Foley was added, all the car explosions and the, couldn't hear the drums, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but Hey, you know, you get paid and we're in our craft and it's a really, really, but did you ever get to meet Ralph McDonald? He was another hero of mine. No, I never met Ralph, but I, I believe, and this is uh, something that I told my daughter when she started with George Benson, Ralph not only was the percussionist, but he was the producer. Ah. So he produced a lot of the George Benson's album. He was a great producer. Uh, he lived in New Jersey, New York. Uh, I never met him, but we knew each other from long distance and uh, loved the guy. And, uh, and I, I love a couple of things uh, that Ralph said. Um, uh, always he kept a little recording thing on, on his car, but now we got the phone. Yeah. And at that time, uh, he said on a, on a drum clinic with Steve Gadd, somebody asked him, so you guys grew so well, why do you have to play with a click? And he basically just killed that really quickly. He goes, let me tell you something. It's not that I cannot groove and Steve Gadd cannot groove. Obviously, Steve can groove even like right now. He just demonstrated it. But I will say 80% of everything we do is with a click and it's not because of the groove it's because of other things that you know people don't understand so with that being said that and and then one of the, the things that he said he said that one time on a traffic jam from new york back to his house his wife had dinner ready and he was in the car and traffic jam and basically he was just there and he turned on the little recorder and he's, he mumbled Closer I get to you. And so he basically just hummed that and he made it into a song. And then Reggie, the guitar player, wrote da 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 da. And they developed that into a song. Roberta Flack did it, million dollar seller. The yep. closer I get to you with Donny Hathaway. Yeah. I, I, he, well, my favorite story of his is that he wrote just the two of us for Grover exactly. Washington, and it was recorded 80 times over the years by different artists. So this Ralph wasn't a drummer that was waiting for the phone to ring for him to pay his mortgage. The guy had publishing. So drummers exactly. out there, write some songs. Hey, Wally, guess what? This is Jim's favorite part of the show. It's a fan favorite. Stay tuned. You're going to love it. Jim? Yes. It's that part of the show, isn't it? Yes. It well, is. hit us with that jingle. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. <laughs> we have a random question that I get to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wally, what near future predictions do you have? Near future predictions. The future is going to be bright, fruitful, and positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's a page from my playbook. I love that, man. Bob Marley gonna, said that. Actually. Oh. I'll do a winner shout for that. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, Jim. We get the, th the threshold's a little low on that because it, it goes that? away really quick. Okay. We're, gonna, we're, we're still working on things on the Rich Redmond Show here. We're always trying to grow and threshold? improve. Well, it's like, it's like whenever I'm you joking. do like the hands clapping and that kind of stuff, it just goes away so yeah. fast like it's over-compressed. So, Zoom. 
So Wally, I know that we probably need to wrap up, man, but like, you know, what's, uh, what's, I know next year is going to be amazing. What's, uh, what's the future look? What's the next five years look like for you, man? What are you excited about? Well, um, aside from coming You're a newlywed. <laughs> I want to, you know, I have a, a bunch of songs, Burry talking about Ralph McDonald and inspiration. Sure. I have a lot of songs that I started since the nineties and they're my pop rock uh, songs in Spanish and English. Beautiful. So I, of course, uh, you know, I have two CDs that I wanted to show like really quick. I have this one that is uh, Wally World that is like a trip around the world, different grooves. And this one is just jamming at the baked potato, which is just cover tunes. Beautiful. And um, an instructional DVD that I did, uh, Global Beats, that nice. I did uh, in 2004. But with that being said, I'm working on finishing those pop songs before I go to the grave and maybe other instrumental albums and just play as much as I can with different people, whether it's Chicago. And now that I got this going, I know that I'll be doing a lot of music from my place and doing tracks, interchanging tracks with different people because what coronavirus has done is when we get back, uh, I'll be taking my little keyboard and my laptop to every hotel room and I'm going to be finishing some stuff while we're not on Ch with Chicago yeah, on stage. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but with Chicago also uh, just opened up, finish a recording studio that used to be part of the Caribou ranch in Colorado. They yeah. used to have it in the, in the seventies. So, uh, Lee Lockney just finished a, a recording studio in Sedona, Arizona, which is really Love a gorgeous Sedona. setting. And we'll be, we're going to be recording there, I guess, next year. As That'll be great. Recording. So uh, basically that, and basically I know we all are going to be stronger, better, and cleaner. Yes. And, and safe, safe and sanitized, man. But, you know, it was, a it, was, it was an interesting world year, I'm sure, that we all learned and, and grew from the experience, man. But I really appreciate your friendship and your inspiration over the years, man. And uh, I look forward to us uh, visiting in the future. Maybe we'll get the whole f – your brother and your dad on, man. Oh, my God. Yeah, my dad alone can write a book. And, yeah. And, you know, uh, he, uh, he has a lot of history. and a What lot is he, 88 years young now? He's 87, but nobody has told him. So yeah. uh, he thinks he's like in his 40s. <laughs> no, that's that's a good thing, man. That is a really, really good thing. Jim, you got any parting thoughts, my friend? I do. Uh, at, at the end of the day, when you have those days that you get up, Wally, and, and you know things aren't going right and they're frustrating and you want to make another Instagram post of you just going, ah, like that, I just want you to remember me saying to you, you're the inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that face. Oh my God, it's just covered in, in fake cheese, man. Just, just. Well, you know, I sometimes I feel that people think that, you know, I'm a millionaire, my life is everything amazing every day, and everything's perfect. And it's not. I mean, we're all humans. Oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. It's not. <laughs> oh, forget about this then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, we're all humans. I mean, and you know, we have ups and downs and hopefully we'll be all be healthy. I know some friends of mine have gone through health issues and it's not COVID, but cancer or whatever. So, you know, we're all uh, you know, in situations and we yeah. do the best we can and you know, be kind to each other out there because uh, going back to that hater thing on on social media, yeah. I've never, ever, ever uh, gone to one of those YouTube and seen like Steve Gadd, Harvey Mason, you know, commenting negatively. No. <laughs> no. They're too busy living their lives playing music. Yeah, exactly. No. So <laughs> yeah. You, that would be hilarious like, if they did. Right? I mean, I'm, <clears throat> Peter Eschke nev never, to, uh, you know, so That's like, actually uh, a very funny idea if all of a sudden like the name drummers just started ganging up on some of these other like amateur drummers. kids like you yeah. suck kid <laughs> yeah right <laughs> give it up yeah your parents spent six hundred dollars on this yeah. drum set yeah so you know we all have a our, our own identity and our own uh styles and we don't have to you know the comparison <laughs> thing comparison thing always happens yeah and you know just um uh, you know, go out there and just like be you and trying to, but you know, like with your courses, you have a, a lot of many ways of guide uh, a person because 
playing drums is one thing. It can be therapeutic. It can be really fun. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you're great on the drum set, that you're a professional drummer. Yeah. Because that's, that's like I can cook some really good dishes now yeah, after coronavirus. Really good, yeah. And I'm not in the restaurant business and I don't own a restaurant. I'm not a professional chef. Yeah. So I'm an amateur chef. I cook when I want to, what I want to, where I want to. Yeah, we'll have to get get back to the the, the chicken, the black beans, and the plantains at oh, Guant yes. Guantanamera in New York City. That's, right. That's our spot, man. <laughs> we were there together, uh, Rich and I, man, and uh, it was uh, New York City, man. I love you, New York City. You can't beat it, especially, in the, especially, I would say, in the holidays. You know, I'd love to go ice skating at 30 Rock. I've never yeah. done it. I want to do it because I'm a fairly good skater. I can disco ice skate. You're man, more than fairly good. You're pretty damn good. Uh, yeah, we'll have to come to Cincinnati. We're actually neighbors, man. You just come over the hill, you know? You know, there's a ice skating ring right there in downtown Cincinnati. We'll go to Grater's Ice Cream, and then we'll... Skyline well, Chili. To my you house. have me at ice cream. And we'll jam at your house on that DW kit, man. Yeah. Well, man, That's thank right. you so much for your time. Everyone, uh, keep in touch with Wally. He's easy to find. We'll put the uh, all of his socials in the show notes, but WalfredoReyesJr.com. Trust me. Check it out. And thank you to everyone for supporting Jim and I out there. We got an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. Send us some praise. Send us some criticism. We'll get it all fixed up. We appreciate your input, of course. Subscribe, share, rate, review. You keep coming back for the good stuff. Happy holidays, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Wally. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.